So I think I'd like to start out by just asking you to give a brief summary about who you are, what you do, just for anybody who might be watching that don't know who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Mary Elizabeth Bowden, and I am a trumpeter. Uh, I play a lot of solos and concertos and recitals, and I'm also the founder and director of Seraph Brass, which is an all-female brass group. And we, when the world is running, we do about 40 to 60 concerts a year all around the world. And um, I'm also married to a trumpeter, David Dash, and so we do a lot of duo concerts together as well. And so I've made a full-time career creating projects for myself. And um, after doing that for a couple of years, I was approached by Shenandoah Conservatory and was asked to audition for that position. And so I did kind of for fun and got it. So now I have another full-time job on top of the full-time job that I already had as, as a performer. But I realized that I really missed teaching a lot. I was doing a lot of master classes, but I really love having my own studio and having that that team of students to to really help and motivate so i've really enjoyed adding that addition on to already the crazy life that i already have so um it's, and i'm also an orchestral trumpeter um in my 20s that was my main focus and so um i'm very comfortable in that world as well so i i still play a few weeks in the orchestra in different positions for fun you know and and uh, just because I really like having a lot of variety, you know, each week when I am performing is extreme. Each week is completely different. I've also started Baroque trumpet. I was supposed to do a Baroque gig in April. Um, so I'm always just kind of throwing new things in the mix and keeping things um, extremely flexible. That sounds awesome. Like, um, so I'm going to take it back and back to when you were younger and I want to know when you started playing the trumpet and what made you interested in starting to play? I was 10 years old and it was the kind of normal thing that we have in the U.S. where, you know, when the fifth, fifth grade comes up, that's when you're invited to be in the band and to pick an instrument if you want. And I have two older brothers and they're two and three years older. So not too much older, but old enough at that age to be a lot better than me, you know, when, when you're younger, those age differences make a huge, make a huge difference. And so they, they already had picked trombone and horn. And I really wanted to play the horn. It's such a beautiful instrument. And my brother would not let me, he was very upset that I even considered it. So I wanted to stay in the brass family because we had a brass teacher, a uh, horn player who taught brothers. And I wanted to have the same teacher. So I picked the trumpet and my first teacher had me start on cornet um, because he thought it would help um, give me a nicer sound concept. And I really believe that that was very uh, smart of him to do that because I still have that cornet. It's a Yamaha professional cornet in the same mouthpiece. And it's a very warm, rich sound. And I feel like that really helped get that sound in my, the rich sound in my ear. So when I got my first trumpet a, a few years later, um, I did not have a bright sound concept. And I, I even think to this day, when I get a new trumpet or try something new, I, it always, the sound always kind of darkens throughout time because I just have like more of a horn uh, cornet sound in my head just because of, that's what I started on when I, was, when I was 10. Wow. So what for you is the most difficult thing about playing the trumpet or what was the most difficult thing about playing the trumpet when you first started? Well, I, I remember the first day when I got the Yamaha cornet out of the box, the bubble wrap, and there's the first page of the band book was just whole notes on a G. Um, and I played that all day. And I thought by the end of the day, wow, I've only had the cornet for a day and I can play that first page. And then my brothers came in the room and laughed at me and said, you're not playing a G, you're playing a low C. And I was so upset. <laughs> I remember it was like, it, I felt so embarrassed and really upset. So I just, right off the bat, I was just, I felt like I just wanted to be as good as my brothers. And I got a fair amount of teasing from them. They're like my best friends. They're totally fine. But like as kids, you know, they kind of gave me a hard time. 
um, since I was always worse than them because of the age difference. So I got a lot of teasing from them, which kept me pretty motivated actually, because I would hear them practice and then I would go practice. Um, we really did motivate each other. So that was, um, I remember feeling frustration, but then I also really loved being challenged. Um, I did get braces on after one year of playing. Um, my brother did two on horn and it really, he was such a natural player that it really affected his motivation. But for me, I kind of, it didn't really affect me. I just kept, I just kept practicing a lot and worked through it. I, I don't remember it be like really bringing down my morale too much. I just knew that I had to work even harder to build the range back up. And um, so that was, that was the hardest part in the beginning, I think is just, um, I wouldn't even say it was a hard part. It was just, you know, I just remember feeling challenged and in a good way when I was young. So how did the braces affect your playing? Like, did it, did it change the way, like, you had, like, played with pressure? Did it make you play with less pressure? So did it eventually help you in the long run? Or did you get any injuries, like, cuts from the braces? Well, you know, with trumpet, there is pressure. You know, it's not a, a, word, a word we try to stay away from, but there is some pressure. And I had top and bottom metal braces. And I tried without for a while. But there's, like, you know, there is some pressure and the constant wear and tear on the metal on the lips does cause some marks. And so um, my friend who was my age, also a female trumpeter, she had them too. And she found this really thick wax um, that you could order specially. So, and then you like warm it up in your hand and I would just put it on the top and bottom and work it in, make it, make the surf. I made the surface completely smooth. I didn't even care that it jutted out more. I just wanted it to feel smooth. And that's what I did for two and a half years, and it worked really great. Um, so I remember my parents were not happy because I would sometimes put it on the floor in the ba got practice in the basement, and so there'd be these yellow things on the floor <laughs> that would stick. Um, but yeah, just creating that smooth surface was really um, a game changer for me, and then my range was able to go back up. I was I had a very severe overbite, so when I played the cornet, it looked like I was playing. The, cor the clarinet. <laughs> it was it was like this, you know, it was so the braces were really helpful to get the overbite manageable. So I, I'm still pretty downstream, but not like a clarinet, you know, so I think that was super helpful to have the braces. It's just, you know, when you're that age starting an instrument, it's just such a, I've seen so many younger students struggle with that and just not want to get the wax. And I'm just a firm believer. The wax worked great for me. I didn't even think about it. So I just knew that I wanted to feel something similar to the real teeth. You know, there's no reason why you should suffer with having the metal things in your lip. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you said that you were really motivated by your brothers, but did you have any other role models when you were first starting out? Um, when I first started out, so we were really, really lucky. Um, and our first teacher, the horn player, he, um, he was a graduate of Eastman and he decided not to be a performer for his living and he's a computer programmer but he loves teaching I, I can't even remember how my family found him but he just really loves teaching and sharing music and my brothers and I were all very motivated so he would come to our house every Saturday and like spend all day at the house we would have like two hour lessons each um, and that was like my first three years of lessons were like that, like very long lessons, just spending all day together. And on top of that, um, I'm from Chicago, the Chicago suburbs. He would take us to concerts and he like a, a fair amount. I saw a lot of Chicago symphony concerts and those were in the late nineties. So I got to hear Bud Herseth's last concerts with the orchestra, which was really, really great. And, he took us to all the brass master classes. Even I would even go to all instruments. Gail Williams, horn, um, Barbara Butler, and Charlie Geyer were in town, so I saw their events that we that the public could go to. And you know, there's so many phenomenal brass players in that area that I was very lucky that our teacher was just we were little kids, and he's just driving us to all these concerts. Ravinia and Grant Park, we went every week with him. Um, so we're so grateful to him that he, you know, had us hearing live music all of the time. And then when I was, um, 
about 13 or 14, I switched to a trumpet teacher and Tim, my first teacher, really helped me handpick a teacher he thought would be good. And he, he really wanted me to study with a female trumpeter. Um, and I didn't even think twice about it. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. You know, and, and I realized at that point I had never had like a female role model. And so I studied with Carrie Lee and in the Chicago area. Her, she also is married to a trumpeter. So I joke about that. I married a trumpeter too. <laughs> um, I just thought it was so cool, you know, because trumpeters, they just play all the time and share ideas. Um, but she was a great influence. She was really hard on me um, in, in a lot of great ways and really challenged me to play really difficult repertoire that I didn't think I could play. Like for college auditions, I played Tomasi Concerto. I, I didn't think I could play it, but she somehow knew I could and was just throwing repertoire at me and piccolo repertoire. And um, so she was, she was my first really big uh, positive role model, female role model. And so it was, that was really um, great to have her in my life, you know, because performers, you know, when I would see concerts, Barbara Butler in Chicago was the only, one of the very few female trumpeters that I saw on stage, as well as Carrie was performing a lot too. So um, having those two women in Chicago was pretty cool. Um, but two, you know, <laughs> out of how many, I remember seeing Dallas Brass um, and Canadian all male groups, and I never, I never thought anything about it. But now, um, with Seraph Brass, that's been something that's been really cool is to see the reactions of young uh, brass students, whether they're male or female. You know, just presenting a group that is all female with strong brass players, um, I think is really cool. That the world is changing in that way. Hopefully, in the next ten years or so like we won't have to use the label female brass group. It'll just be more normalized and a more equal, uh, there'll be more, more equal showcasing of the genders, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really awesome what, what you do and um, why you do it. Um, and we'll get, we'll get to some questions about your group in a little bit, but um, I wanted to, you, you mentioned that you auditioned for college with the Tomasi. And I wanted to know, when did you know that you wanted to pursue a career in trumpet performance? Um, I think for me, I had a very um, unusual schooling path for high school. I did not go to high school. Um, and it's not because I'm like a genius or anything. Um, I was in eighth grade and I, and I just remember being really frustrated with the music program there and I had already joined one of the local youth orchestras and um, my brothers had left high school in the middle of high school through a program called early leavers program and so they left high school and they were already in the community college and I was super jealous and I was like I do not want to go to high school um, I knew at that point that I wanted to be a musician and I knew that I needed more time to practice and I knew for me, marching band was not the answer. Um, in a lot of schools in Illinois, that's a really big part of the program. And I think it's really great to be part of if you like that. But I, I hated marching. <laughs> like, I'm very clumsy. So like, it's not really a strength of mine, you know, so uh, I just wanted more time to practice. Uh, and so leaving school and doing my own thing was really great and I'm so glad that my parents were flexible with us to kind of figure out something that is completely outside the box and so what I ended up doing was immediately enrolling in a community college at age 14. The counselor snuck me in because you're supposed to be 16. Um, I was already my full height. I'm pretty tall 5'11 so she's like you're fine just get good grades and it'll be fine because it's the same classes that you take in high school the general requirements, you just get them done in a semester and you get to choose your own schedule. And I loved that because I wanted to practice and I wanted to work a job so I could save up and buy a piccolo trumpet. Um, so I already had these goals in my head of like why high school would be terrible for me. Um, so I did the community college thing. I went to school with my brothers, which was really cool. And I had a lot more time to practice and work a job so I could save money. And then I was in Chicago Youth Symphony um, and the jazz band at the community college. So I had tons of musical outlets. Um, I just, it was just, a, so for me, I think I had already had it in my head at age 14, 
13, 14, that this is what I wanted to do because I crafted my whole years that most people go to high school, I crafted that in the way that would, what would work best for me to practice more. Wow. That's just, that's so cool. I wish I had thought to do that. <laughs> well, it was, it was kind of hilarious because I'm not sure if, how my parents figured this out, but like you need a high school diploma to get an associate's degree from the community college. So um, once I had enough credits for that degree, my parents typed up homeschool tra transcripts. I was never homeschooled, but I, you know, I had the classes for community college, the grades, and they just took those and called it the Bowden School and submitted it to the local high school and I got my high school diploma. Um, so it's just thinking outside the box and being not afraid to break rules. So I really blame my parents for that part of my personality. I'm always kind of I feel like breaking, breaking the rules and like, don't really take no for answers a lot of the time. <laughs> that sounds like a great way to approach things. So what were some other things that you did to get where you are now as a performer and educator? Like, did you compete in competitions? Did you get work experience at a young age? Or like, did you work with networking and meeting new people and that's that sort of stuff? Um, so as far as being a soloist, I had a very um, unconventional path because, um, you know, I did a lot of solos when I was a teenager and I think Carrie was pushing me in that direction and um, I was unsure about it. You know, I didn't know much about it and my parents are not musicians. I just wanted to, you know, figure out a way to make a good living. And, uh, and so I was just like kind of just playing Tomasi and Joe LeVay when I was 17 and um, just learning all the repertoire. And then when I took college auditions, I got into Curtis. Um, and so I didn't even, even really know what Curtis was when I auditioned, but I found out pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and so I went there and, you know, my teacher there, David Bilger is wonderful, beautiful sound. And, um, but I was really pushed to pursue an orchestral career that I was like, that's the, I was, kind of told maybe, you know, maybe I misunderstood it in that age because I, I notice now as a teacher, when I tell students things, they can kind of misinterpret it a little bit. So I think as educators, we have to be very careful with how we deliver our message to students. Because um, maybe I just heard something and just it kind of stuck in my brain that I somehow thought, and I also my colleagues at Curtis, wonderful brass players, but they were all so obsessed with orchestral playing and orchestral auditions that I kind of just thought that was the only way to make a living. And so I kind of put the brakes on solo playing. I mean, I played in recitals and things and learned new pieces, but I did not do any competitions, um, none of that. I was just trying to get trained to be an orchestral trumpet player. Um, and so I had the hugest equipment and um, I took many auditions in my 20s and I was playing um, a full-time career as an orchest orchestral trumpet player in my 20s um, and I just started to feel um, a little bit antsy like I was successful and I'm, I'm really grateful for my orchestral life that I still have here and there because it makes me a better teacher. Um, a lot of soloists don't have that experience of knowing the orchestral repertoire, sitting, being able to play in the symphony and the section and sound great so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, but, uh, in my late twenties, I was getting like kind of antsy. Like, I don't know if this is what I really wanted to do all of the time to play second trumpet. Um, and so I just, I was, I got, um, an artistic admin job at Richmond Symphony. Um, I would also, because I needed like a little bit of extra income because my position with the symphony is per service. So it wasn't enough to make a living, a, a living on. So I had to find find other ways to make a living. Uh, and so I did, I got this artistic admin job at the symphony and I taught at Virginia Commonwealth University. So I had my first teaching job, um, which I never thought I would do through college either. But then all of a sudden I had to, and um, just to make a living. And then I turned out that I really liked it. So that was cool. Um, but with the artistic admin job, that was just to make extra money. But I really learned how the soloist world works because I was communicating with artists managers um, and companies and I kind of was like kind of you know peeking into their world of how it works to get work as a soloist and how managers negotiate and 
was looking at all these artist websites and I was thinking this is what I wanted to do when I was like 16 years old and I never pursued it. I never thought I could do it. Um, and I was like, why did I just completely ignore that? I just completely was like orchestral is the only way to make a living. And then I started seeing, you know, people emerging like Alison Balsam and, uh, you know, other Tina Ting house up. And I was like, there are women that can do this. Why did I have it in my head that like, I couldn't do it. Um, and so I started to feel like I needed something more in my life. And I didn't really know what that was, but then I met your teacher, Jens Lindemann in 2010. I, I just, on a whim, I was like leafing through musical America trying to find festivals because I could never really do festivals in college because I had to work and make money. Um, so uh, when I was older working in my mid twenties, I was like, oh, I can finally afford to do festivals and not make money and just go to a festival. So I went to the BAMP Center kind of on a whim. It looked like something different and I knew who Jens was. I didn't know that much about his teaching or anything, but he turned out to be the most influential person that I had met for my career because he, the first day, he was like, what do you want to do with your residency here? And I was like, I don't know, I guess I can play Tomasi with piano or something. He was like, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, he lined up a demo recording for me to do a demo CD. And so I recorded Talamon and Haydn and Syrinx. And that's where I met my recording engineer who I still work with today. He was also doing like a residency there. So he got me inspired to do that. And he really asked me the hard questions of what do you really want to do? And I remember saying at first, like, well, what I want to do doesn't matter because it's not possible. And he was like, no, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I want to be a soloist, but I don't think I'm good enough. Uh, the tools to be able to do this. And so that was like the first person who told me since Carrie that I could do it. And so just having a powerful mentor like that, I think is, is really important to students. Um, and so I just, I had to take a few years of lessons. I, I sought out lessons with Hokan Hardenberger and um, like a lot of soloists around the world. I did Chosen Veil and put myself out there and didn't play very well a, a lot of the time during <laughs> like dealing with nerves and stuff I wasn't used to. And I figured it out. I figured out how to be comfortable playing recitals and concertos and started to get a lot of confidence. And my playing completely changed. I changed equipment and um, really started to feel like I was speaking through the trumpet with my own voice for the first time. And, you know, just in, in a very uh, extroverted way. And so that was exciting to see that those changes. And then when I was 30, I finally got I was finally I finally was able to do a competition I hadn't done any <laughs> because I was aged out of most and um Ellsworth Smith the cutoff is 30 I think so I made it right in time so I took the whole summer off and I prepared and I worked so hard and then at the BAMP Center I was studying with Jens again and I was lifting up a music stand and it popped up and it cut my lip here oh, and uh first. <laughs> I remember Jens' face in the hallway because I came out and there was like blood and he was just like, oh no. <laughs> but I iced it and I healed pretty quickly. And so within a couple of weeks, I was back on track and I went to visit my husband in Santa Fe. He plays trumpet and opera there in the summer. And um, I remember running the list that morning with a pianist and Dave was like, this is the best you've ever sounded. And then I was walking to my car late at night um, after the opera that evening and my reaction time was kind of slow because I was super tired. And uh, the musicians were hanging out in the parking lot and somebody threw a Frisbee. I hate Frisbee, I don't play it. And someone threw a Frisbee and it, I was saying hi to a friend and it, it bounced off her head and it hit me right here. The same spot. <laughs> and uh, in a different spot. Mm -hmm. So the first injury was here. And so it didn't cut the muscle and it was not where the mouthpiece hits. And so. Oh that healed all fast because it wasn't in the zone. It was like just above it. But this injury, I knew right when it hit that it was game over because it hit, it hit like here. Um, and it swelled up like a huge duck bill right away. And it was like, I think it was like three and a half weeks before the competition. And I was just like, 
are you kidding me? <laughs> like, you know, it was just, it was just, it was bad. It was all black and blue inside and, um, it just hit in like the worst way possible. And I tried to heal myself and I tried to challenge myself to do it anyway. And I went anyway and I played and I couldn't really play the physically challenging stuff. You know, I couldn't play very loud. I could play Haydn and hair tell fine, but some of the other meteor stuff, I just couldn't, it was just too injured. I was still pretty bruised. Um, so I didn't take the advice of just letting the competition go and not going. I was pretty stubborn and I could have injured myself more and I'm lucky that I didn't. And I took time off after that and it was like, you know, I had just signed with a manager um, and I didn't tell him that I got in the face. I was like, let's just, I'm just going to figure this out. Um, and so I was just kind of freaking out like, okay, what do we do? So I let myself heal and then I slowly came back and my playing was different and it was really scary. Um, I played a recital with my husband um, like a few months after that. And for the first time when I got tired, notes would just stop coming out. And I was like, this is new, this is different, this is not good. Um, and so I started really thinking about everything that Hokan had taught me, which I had not really used before that, with like these muscles. I was only playing from here and I didn't know how to engage these. And so um, just because I had to for survival, these muscles started working for the first time, I think, ever. <laughs> um, and so my playing really changed in a, gr in a great way. Um, and I was able to play Brandenburg Concerto, which I was always a good piccolo player, but I could never hit that range. And so I was finally able to, do, to develop that and do that. And now I feel like a much stronger player overall because of that injury, because I had to figure out um, how to play through it and play in a healthier, stronger way than I ever had before. Um, and so now these are always working. You know, if for some reason I, I get lazy or whatever and I press here, it, the same thing happens. It'll swell up and, you know, because the scar, the scar is still there. Um, so now I, I just feel like I'm much, I'm a much healthier player. I'm not sure if I could play through Seraph brass shows before the injury you know i don't know if i was that strong of a player to be able to handle that kind of heavy quintet playing um so yeah that was just kind of a at the time i thought it was the worst thing that could possibly happen to me <laughs> but looking back i mean looking forward to now i think you know i really made the best of it and became a stronger player through that wow how long did you have to rest um, after the competition before you started to reintroduce yourself to the trumpet again? Um, I think it was about a month at least, um, but I did kind of rush back into it again a second time because I had also made finals for Concert Artist Guild. So like that Frisbee really killed two big opportunities for me to try. And so I tried coming back for that and I remember going to that competition and still feeling pretty tender. Um, and then I took more time off. Then I took time off again after that, probably another month. Um, so I was pretty stubborn. I wanted to try because it was my last chance being 30 years old. But it was looking back, if I could go back in time, I would have just completely backed out of both competitions and just taken like two and a half months off completely. Um, but I was pretty stubborn and sad because <laughs> it was like, you know, 30 years old. It was like my last chance. I don't know why I thought I could all of a sudden just play better than how the injury felt, you know. So if you're injured, let your lip heal and because you, there's so much time in life to to play that it's better just to it's better just to have things heal <laughs> properly. Yeah. So I was lucky that I didn't injure myself more. I think I was already a healthy player, so that worked to my benefit. It wasn't wasn't a playing injury. It was, you know, someone hit me in the face. Um, but I did have to relearn how to play and these muscles really developed a lot. Wow, that sounds like something that was really, really difficult to deal with. Um, so what kind of other challenges have you faced in your career due to the fact that you are a woman? Like, was there any stereotyping going on or any prejudice that you experienced? Um, Yes, I'm trying to think of the. I usually try to like just ignore. I mean, I don't. I don't ignore it when it happens, but um, I always just try to spin things in a positive way and not dwell 
on that stuff too much, but I do think that if we're in a position where there is some weird stuff happening that, you know, we should feel comfortable sticking up for ourselves in some way. And, you know, I don't have all the answers to that, but, you know, I did have, when I was still at the end, tail end of pursuing a full-time orchestral career, I did a trial in an orchestra in New Zealand as principal and I won the audition blind from a tape. And I got there and like, I had a meeting with the conductor the first week. I mean, the orchestra is very nice orchestra. Um, but I think it was just the conductor at the time. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will anyway. It's been a lot of years, so. Um, but I asked him if he had any comments from rehearsal and he was like, I, I'm sorry, I just don't see a woman sitting as principal trumpet. And I was like, what? And I didn't do anything. I mean, I should have went to, maybe I should have gone to the personnel manager. I don't really know. I was so young that I didn't really know what to do. I kind of was just like, what? I mean, <laughs> what I've learned now is if, if don't ask people what they think. I mean, yes, you can if it's a trusted colleague or friend, but if you're taking an audition and you're playing a role as principal, I would just avoid the question of asking how you're doing. You know, just play the way you play, use your ears and be confident. And so looking back on that, I don't want to blame myself for that, but I think maybe I was just ask the, asking the question made me seem, um, made me seem like the stereotype of like a shy woman trumpet player where I should have just played and not asked any questions. I don't know, who knows, but uh, I think it worked out for the best because, you know, I stayed in the States. Um, my husband and I got engaged a few months after that. And that's what, after that audition is when I really started pushing for a solo career. So I think it worked out for the best. <laughs> that's so crazy that someone would make a comment like that. I probably just wasn't even thinking. I don't even know, but it's, it's, words are so powerful, you know, it's, yeah, it really is. Um, so you've mentioned that you've done soloist stuff, you've done chamber stuff, you've done orchestral playing, and you even mentioned that you played in a jazz band a little bit, I think. In, in when, I was, when I was a teenager, yeah, not so much as a professional, you know, like, of course, we have to know how to play in the jazz style, like, if you're on an orchestra gig, I mean, that stuff pops up all the time, so, um, but I don't really play a lot of jazz, so. Yeah, but you have a lot of versatility in your playing. And do you think that it's important that students um, and people who are trying to build their career as a as a trumpet player that they become versatile in like all of those areas? I think it's I think it's important. You know, of course, there's always the issue of like maybe spreading yourself too thin or not getting really great at one thing. So I think everybody is a little different. Um, each person's going to be a little bit different with what they can manage. Um, for me, I can switch back to my orchestral gears pretty quickly because that's what I spent a, a lot of my life doing in my 20s. Um, so that comes back pretty naturally to play in the orchestra. Um, or I know how to play second trumpet and match a principal trumpet. You know what I mean? So those skills, those skills are learned through experience. You know, I wasn't always, I wasn't always great at that. Um, I was really lucky to be at Curtis during a time where we did like three orchestra readings a week uh, and we went through a ton of repertoire. We had famous conductors coming every other week and so I really got like a ton of training through that and but I think all of that ties into solo playing and um, everything. I just see everything as chamber music whether it's a large orchestra or a brass quintet or um, playing with a pianist. Um, I do find that playing concertos feel the most, I don't want to say unnatural, but they're just a little strange for me uh, in comparison to the other work that I do because you're, they always have you, you know, standing in front of the orchestra where like I want to be playing, yes, as a soloist, but like for that to feel like chamber music, I have to, sometimes I, I've been, I'd experimented in my last concerto where I kind of backed up so I could see the concert master and the other strings. And I felt a lot more comfortable because I felt connected with them. So I think I might 
always keep that in mind for my next concerto appearances. You know, some soloists stand really far out ahead. I want to be like in that nook of this, the strings, the, you know, the first violins. Um, it just feels, then it feels like you're like playing along with them, like a giant chamber music group, as opposed to just the soloists in the front doing whatever and the orchestra in the back. Yeah. Um, so. That's really cool. That's an interesting, it's an interesting approach. I hadn't really thought about that before. So for, for your solo performances or your chamber group performances, do you have a pre-performance routine that you do to like get in the zone? Um, there's something that I learned from uh, Don Green. I don't know if you know that name. He is a uh, musician uh, coach. He used to be, um, he used to work with Olympic athletes and help them win the Olympics. <laughs> then he moved over to musicians. And, you know, he's taught at Juilliard and Colburn and he, his, his books are amazing and his, his teaching is great. And, um, one of the tools that he has is called centering and, you know, you start off learning that pretty slowly and then you learn how to do it within 10 seconds. And I find that like, um, you know, for me, I get pretty sleepy before something really stressful. Um, like during this pandemic, I don't feel like I'm extra stressed, but I've been sleeping like at least 10 hours a night, like a lot of sleep, probably because of stress a little bit. Um, so I get tired. That's how I, I get sleepy. <laughs> um, and so sometimes midday I take a nap. There's all these funny photos of me on tour where I'll just, I'll just curl up next to my trumpets on stage and like literally close my eyes for 10 minutes and fall asleep and then wake up and I feel ready to go. So um, that's what I like to do. But usually before a show, I like to be flexible and not just say I have to do this routine because when you're traveling and touring, a lot of things can happen. Um, you know, with Serif Brass, I'm often running around trying to set up the camera right beforehand. And then people start talking to me and I start talking to people and, um, setting up the merchandise out in the lobby. And then I have like, Oh, it's like five minutes I'm, I'm warmed up, but you know, I'm not backstage. Like the other ladies are like meditating and doing their thing and I'm running around and I don't have that luxury of doing some like 15 minute meditation or something. I just, I don't have time for that sometimes. So the centering backstage really quickly has been a really helpful tool um, to just get focused quickly. Now with the concerto, there's, I feel like there's a lot of waiting because orchestras take care of you. You're, I'm not setting up my own merchandise, you know, I'm like in my dressing room just sitting. And in a way that's a little bit more nerve wracking because I'm just like waiting. I'd almost would rather be running around, you know, distracting myself a little bit. So for concertos, um, I just try to listen to some different kinds of music and sing through the piece, take my nap. I actually drink a coffee before because of this, that would work very badly for some people, but I, I need a little bit of extra energy to um, battle the kind of the sleepiness that I get when I'm stressed. Um, but everyone's different and you kind of learn what works for you with experimenting a little bit. Um, I didn't think that I could do a serif brass show with being super distracted, you know, running around because before that, my earlier recitals, I would have to have a routine before but then again, with touring, our first big serif tour was in 2016, and we did five weeks in a row driving in a van across the United States. And you just learn pretty quickly that you have to be flexible and crazy things can happen on the road. You know, we had our van break down and we were like rushing to a concert. Like the, and the audience would have had no idea that we went through that, you know, because you still have to go on stage and be professional and play a great show and just to be able to turn that on no matter what crazy stuff is happening that day while you're on the road. Cause when you're touring, like I said, like so many things can happen as a soloist, your plane can get, your flight can get delayed and you miss rehearsal and you have to play the concert with like a dress rehearsal. So, and oftentimes uh, every solo performance that I've had, almost every single concerto that, I, that I've had, the orchestra requires that I rehearse the concerto the day of the show, you know, and that's also very typical. That's very typical for, I'm not sure in Europe, but at least in America orchestras, American orchestras, 
orchestral players have to run the show too that morning. So even if it's a Mahler symphony, you run it in the morning and you perform at night. And so we're, we're always having to have that experience. And so we get used to that too, um, as a soloist, having to being prepared to like rehearse the piece, rest and then perform it. Of course, I think it would be better for me if I just didn't have rehearsal that day. <laughs> but that's the way orchestras work because I think it's geared towards non-brass soloists. So you just kind of have to roll with that and, and not complain and do your best. And um, yeah, it's not super comfortable all the time, but you just make smart, smart choices in the rehearsal and just prepare in that way, knowing that you're going to have a ton of rehearsal on the day of the show. Do you like take it easier in the rehearsal in the morning or do you just like play out all the time? You know, I've had conductors say, oh, just mark it, just whatever. And I, I think on trumpet, you know, if we play kind of in a safe, careful way, I feel like that's more tense and, and damaging for the performance. I play, I might take the dynamic down a little bit. Um, you know what I mean? Or maybe, I, yeah. and I've dropped some things on octave if it's a crazy piece, like this new concerto that I just premiered is pretty crazy. So I wouldn't want to like run that the day of the concert, but you know, you play most of everything you can, but I don't really believe in marking, whatever marking means for trumpet, because yeah. I feel like I, I should just sing my part with my voice then, because if I try to play super careful on the trumpet, it's just, I just, that's going to make, make me more tired. tired. Yeah. So what do you think is the most important thing to keep in mind when pursuing the goal of becoming a performer? Um, I think, um, you know, we live in this world where it's social media is, is a huge thing. And when I was a college student, you know, I, I remember there was none of that. It was just practice and get better. And so I think that um, with students now having that stress of Instagram and social and Facebook, it can be really inspiring, but, but it can also be overwhelming because you might see students your same age posting a lot and maybe you're not ready to post. I would say at this point, you know, if you don't feel ready to post, that's okay. Keep, I think like concentrating on your lessons and getting better and improving every day is, is that's the most important thing. Um, and then when you're ready to, to promote yourself, start putting yourself out there and also really ask yourself, um, you know, some people are super picky with their recordings. They don't want to ever put out anything because it's not ready yet. So you have to know if, if that's reasonable or not. You know what I mean? Like, um, I have some friends who don't post anything ever and they should, they sound amazing, but they're just like, I don't want to. <laughs> and that's okay too. Um, if it works for you, for me, the social media part of stuff has been the game changer in my career because I couldn't win a competition because I'm too, I was too, too old. So I started off on YouTube using you, YouTube was my platform in the beginning. Um, just posting all of my videos on YouTube that I, that I'm happy with. And, um, that's opened up a lot of doors and then Facebook started becoming more popular and that's how I advertised Sarah Frass and myself. And now Instagram is, seems to be the huge way to, um, connect with audiences. And so I think it's just with and present concert presenters are all over Instagram now. And so for me, I know it's really important to my career. And so I know how to use it and I know how to use it well. And I know I have a really good, um, I know what not to post and what to post. <laughs> um, so, but I think for, you know, advice for students is just to right now is the time to fine tune your playing and um, that's always the most important thing before posting anything or putting yourself out there is just the craft of, of becoming a better musician and player and staying really focused in those goals. That is the most important thing as being a high quality performer. So how did you come up with the idea for Sarah Frass? Like it's I see, I see videos of Sarah Frass, like all over the internet. I get emails from my family members saying, look how cool this is. It's an all female group. This is what you want to do. And like, you're a female trumpet player and this is really awesome. But like, how did you first come up with the idea for the group itself? 
So the group started in summer of 2014, and I had the idea a few years before that, maybe like two years before that, with um, a horn player who founded the group with me. And we just thought it would be really cool to um, have an all-female brass quintet because we just didn't see that out there. I think the only one that had, ex I th they formed maybe around 2014, maybe earlier, Stiletto Brass. But I didn't know of any other groups. And so we were like, let's form one. Let's get this started. And it took us a while. I was, you know, living in Richmond and kind of hadn't decided to pursue a solo career or anything like that. And so the idea was kind of hard to form because I didn't, nobody knew what to do. Like, how do you start a group? I don't know. Like, who organizes it? So finally, in 2014, I felt ready to start something. Um, and so I was in touch with the horn player again, and we were like, let's, let's make it happen. And so we just, we found the players that we wanted to start the group with. And um, we decided, since we all lived in different parts of the country, to um, we, we decided, we picked repertoire, we decided we're going to make a demo CD right off the bat, not to sell, but just to have, to show presenters. And we made some videos, some promotional videos, with just like four days of being together for the first time, and photos. Because, you know, we can't wait till we rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, because that's going to happen when we tour, um, being a, a brand new group. Um, so that's, that's the approach that we started with. Um, the mistake that I made, which, you know, things aren't going to go perfect in the beginning, is um, as far as for personnel, I did not choose the right people. And that's really hard. Um, and that's not their fault or my fault. I think it's uh, we didn't have the goals clearly lined out um, about what the people, oh yeah, let's just start a group and let's play together. Let's play concerts. Yay. That sounds fun. Right. Um, but what I wanted was very different than what most of the other people wanted. I wanted to perform literally as much as possible. You know, I wanted to just do as I wanted this group to be in the same sentence as Canadian brass and Boston brass. That has been my dream from the beginning to be, one of the world's top groups and performing all over the world and doing as much as we can. Um, so that means different things to different people. Um, to the other trumpet player, it meant I want to meet twice a year for fun. And that's a very different goal than wanting to play 100 shows a year. Um, so within half the year, most of the group quit. And that's how most groups and ideas die. Um, but the idea was so strong with me and my co-founder that we were like, let's just try new people <laughs> right away. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, it felt very traumatic during that time. Um, but we found new people that seemed interested and we went ahead with that. And I had a tour company that wanted an all-female brass group. And he, tr this presenter trusted me to put it together. So he, he just was like, just get great people. Send me, send me the stuff, and then you'll have 60 concerts for this year. And I was like, all right. So I was able to find the people to do that. And, uh, and at the time, he was okay. We were having some per still some personnel issues with people being able to commit to the concert dates. That's been the hardest thing from the beginning, is getting people to agree to perform, which to me sounds crazy. <laughs> like, um, but it's hard to ch juggle schedules and other offers and things like that, especially if the group is new and you don't know where it's going to go. And um, so we did a trumpet rotation. Um, we had um, th three trumpeters rotating within that year that we were doing the concerts, the, all the, con the, the big tours for the first time. And so we did that. And, um, but the model, the group that was promoted on the website was just five people. And then we had the list of guest artists there as well. But I, I always wanted just five people. I didn't want this kind of rotating stuff. It, you know, it just seemed too hard. And the, the group wasn't like a solid, like these are the five people. Um, so, and, and my co-founder wasn't performing at all because she had twins. And so she was playing zero shows. I think she played two shows that year where the other horn player, who is now our main horn player, um, played 60 shows. <laughs> so finally she stepped down because she realized that you know, she wasn't performing. So once she left, I completely took things 
completely in my own hands and just decided to do things exactly the way that I wanted to do them. Um, and really spent the time finding personnel that could do most of the touring. Um, and so the group is morphed into a model of, we have six core players um, and we have agreed with, with in ourselves that we should all be doing at least 80% of the concert bookings. And there's certain bookings that are more high caliber where there need to be core players. Um, and so that's worked really well. It's added flexibility to the schedule. So, and I, and I think it's just a healthy way for the group to operate. Um, and the reason why we have six is because when we had our trumpet audition, um, I really like Jean and Rachel. And so I just wanted both of them to be included. So we agreed on that for bigger festivals. We've expanded our repertoire to have sextet versions of it. And so we've really had a lot of fun with that, experimenting with that. And so that's been a kind of a cool change for the group. Um, but then during the year, the trumpets rotate um, the tours. And so we try to juggle that. And then with the guest artist list, we do have um, a few guest artists who know the show and they have the tunes memorized and um, they fit into the group seamlessly. And that has been really nice. And so now we're, we've reached a point where it's like, feels really comfortable. We've had the same core members for three years, three and a half years. And we have, a, and, and then our guest artists are also quite strong. So things are running more smoothly than ever. And I guess this is year six. And so um, we finally have things kind of churning like more like a ma machine like we have a Google Drive that we share. And we're, a lot of the decisions are more collaborative. Um, we vote on repertoire and, um, you know, it's just, uh, we're working together now to come up with ideas on how, to, how, how we can stay relevant during this online phase and so we have some things planned um so and and you know our trom our trombone player resigned in the fall so this next season was supposed to be our trombone audition year and it is but now we're not what's going to happen to fall concerts nobody knows that answer yet so we're just kind of trying to stay calm and i mean ever all performers around the world are in the same boat with this conundrum of how are we going to get back on stage? When is it going to be safe? And we're just going to have to take it week by week with the news that we get. But in the meantime, we're trying to do, we're doing Facebook live interviews and thinking of some virtual projects and stuff just to stay relevant to our audiences. Um, so that's been, I mean, it's been interesting for all of us. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has. So, um, I think for my last question, I just wanted to ask you what suggestions or advice do you have for younger musicians who are just starting their careers in music? Um, for, you know, for kids who are like just graduating and- Yeah, like pe people who are just graduating university and they're ready to step out into the world and look, start looking for a career. <laughs> well, I think to keep in mind, like when you're in school, you're already building that network. Um, I know that when I was in Philadelphia, I had already gotten a job with Symphony and C and was already freelancing. So hopefully students are already doing that, already building your network while you're in school. And because um, I know a lot of students end up staying in the same city. So it's important to start that connection, those networking skills as soon as possible. Um, so that's, that's my biggest piece of advice is don't wait to start the networking until after you graduate. It, it, it's an ongoing thing from when you're even a kid you know, that networking begins. Um, and I think staying curious um, and, and realizing that you're going to improve every day um, is, is really important. Um, networking skills are super important. It depends on the, the field of work that you want to do. If you're just freelancing, you know, you have to know all the trumpeters around the town and play for them, play duets with them so they know that you're, you're playing um, and put yourself out there without being too annoying. Um, Whereas if you're going more the entrepreneur route of forming your own group, um, that's a whole nother story. I mean, the, so I, I think just uh, whatever path that you choose, making a, a list, a to-do list essentially of what steps do you need to take to get there? You know, if you're doing orchestra auditions, you're gonna need to take lessons and make your audition packets and have like a really strong practice routine leading up to that audition, you know, like an Olympic athlete 
Um, whereas if you're forming your own chamber group or trying to be a soloist, I mean, you still have to practice in that way, but there's a lot more marketing and marketing skills that you're going to need to learn and um, emails that you're going to have to write to presenters to sell your group and um, as, as well as always practicing the amount that you need to practice to improve every day, not just the amount that keeps you at the same level, but always improving, improving as much as you can, you know, every week. Wow. So. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me. And um, I learned, I learned so much today. And hopefully, once this pandemic is over, we can meet for real in person. <laughs> Awesome. And I hope that you guys, I think your lady trumpet group should totally do a virtual video. It'd be nice to hear from you guys and uh, hope you're all staying sane during this end of your semester. I'm sure you're going to be glad to have some screen time break after this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. Take care.